Okay. All right, Clay. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to close my video, but I'll hang around for a little bit to help people in. That sounds great. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, I'll, um, I'll let people in as they come in. We've got some adults. So um, welcome, you know, so great to have you guys here and you're, you know, we'll feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, and uh, I'm gonna start here. Uh, one of the things that we found, I, and I found over the last uh, 20 years really, is that there seems to be more and more pressure on middle and high school students. Um, and, you know, where does that come from? That's interesting. I, in my school in Maryland, uh, I had uh, run into the superintendent of Montgomery County, Maryland schools, which is a very well-known uh, school district and uh, terrific education overall by reputation. And he said that he would love to have one of his assistant directors of curriculum come by my school and uh, take a tour and sort of see what we're doing, especially as it relates to students with learning differences. So he came over one morning and we started the tour. And I, you know, just in making conversation, I was talking about how my three kids had all gone through Montgomery County Public Schools and were really feeling a lot of pressure and how the pressure had really ratcheted up. Um, and it was, you know, it was really tough. And he turned to me and said, Well, you know, that has nothing to do with school. Students just bring the pressure on themselves. And I sort of wanted to strangle the guy, actually, honestly. But um, you know, I I bit my tongue, and we you know finished the tour, and he you know he saw some things that we were doing at the school. Um, but um, you know, what it really showed me is that it's we really have to do something about the level of pressure that our students are feeling. Um, and again, it's not something they bring on themselves. I have rarely ever met a student in my entire career who didn't want to do well. They want to do well. They want to succeed. They want to please people. They want to please their parents. They want to please their teachers. And they want to be viewed as smart and competent. And they want to have enough hours in the day to get everything done that they need to get done. That's just how students are. And even though they'll push back with their parents because there's an emotional bond there and they're trying to become independent. So there is going to be some pushback. Um, but again, by and large, students want you to be proud of them, right? Your children want you to be proud of them. So I really think that the burden lies in the way schools and activities are set up so that we can really think about the way that we are educating students and the way that we are preparing them for the world. And when, you know, again, I think it's public and private schools, and many of them um, feel like they have to just push harder and harder and have students do more and more work and that that's the answer to um, what, what we're trying to do here, and I really don't think it is. So um, the I'm going to share my screen for a minute here, um, and oh, hang on. Um, and uh, what uh, I want to talk a little bit about today is both the things, especially things that parents can do, and the ways that parents can kind of look out for their children in the world, controlling the things you can control, and also, of course, trying to um, find ways to support them um, and help them manage the world in a way that would, uh, would help them to uh, feel better about themselves. Um, so um, I think what I'm gonna do actually is, all right, let me just plunge in here. So the first thing I think is um, one of the big misconceptions that we have um, in this country about learning. Um, so, we tend to think of information as the same thing as teaching. There's a lot of information in the world. And of course, today, all the information is available at the touch of a button. If you want to about, find out about turtles in Madagascar, or you want to find out about um, a celebrity, or you want to find out about a president from the long ago, it's very, very easy at the touch of a button to find that information. And so for students, just pouring information onto their plate and rushing through information as fast as we can isn't really teaching. Um, and it's funny because my uh, youngest daughter is a senior in high school down in Maryland this year and finishing up her, uh, her high school career. And I was preparing um, for this talk today and uh, she noticed some of the notes that I was making. And she said, you know, um, can you just tell everybody, or especially if you can find a way to tell teachers that reading a PowerPoint to me is not the same as teaching, I can read it myself. But I've seen some of her um, classes going on. Uh, and so, because she's all virtual and really truly 
but most of her teachers put up a PowerPoint on the screen and then read it to the students. Um, and then that's your 40 minutes of class for every single class. And it's very, very frustrating to the students because it's not interactive, it's not engaging them, it's just information. So I firmly believe in all the work that I've done uh, over my 30 year career in schools is that the goal of content is really to use it as a vehicle for the skills that students need to build to get ready for college and for life. And that means self-advocacy skills, it means reading and writing skills, critical thinking skills, uh, analytical skills, synthesizing information, how do you do that? Um, and of course, independence, being able to use those skills independently, really, really important for students and really not so much important that they get all the content that exists in the world because it's impossible. And I've seen schools, I saw, I was talking to one teacher at a K through eight school down in DC who was teaching the US history class. And the parents were just beside themselves because she had skipped James Garfield's presidency when she was doing the 1880s. And, you know, really, you know, you don't have to cover every single president. You can't cover it all. And uh, truly, ancient history teachers have learned that a long time ago. You can't cover everything. You have to pick and choose. So why don't we have an approach that helps students learn in more breadth, is more depth rather than breadth? And I think this is the challenge with the AP programs, which even the colleges don't like. And you know, it be, as parents, we start to believe what we're told that, oh, you've got to cover all this because if you miss something, you're not ready for college. But really it's the skills that are getting them ready through college, for, for, for college. Um, so one of the words that I despise most is the, is the idea of covering information. To cover material is just to race through it. And I found that, you know, I took a US history course in a public school here in Westchester um, and we covered new, uh, World War II in one day. Um, you know, I don't know what you really learn about World War II in one day, but um, certainly that's not covering it. Um, and it's really um, a, a problem. And I think it's something that many schools are beginning to confront and really think about. And colleges are beginning to send the message that we really want students with the skills rather than just students who have covered everything. And I think that is what leads to a lot of the pressure that students are feeling these days. There's so much material and how do we get through it all? And when you're just focused on content, of course, it leaves a lot less time for exploring. And that might mean exploring the arts. You know, the arts are something that's vanishing from a lot of students' lives um, because they just don't have time. Uh, and I also think that exploring on the most uh, basic level, um, talking to students, hearing their opinions about information and engaging them in conversation. Um, I once had a student who was at a public school who came to interview with the private school that I was uh, working at. I was admissions director at the time. And she said, told me a story that the reason she and her parents were there for this interview was because a couple of days before in her class, in a, in a class of 35 students, one of the boys had raised their hand and asked a question. And the teacher said, that is the best question I've ever heard from a student in my 20 years of teaching. I wish we had time to talk about it, but we've got to cover this material to get through by the end of the week, the stuff material for the test. So this girl actually, a 10th grade girl said to me, if it's the best question in 20 years and we don't have time to answer it, something's wrong. And so, um, you know, parents can't necessarily change schools, but we're gonna to talk tonight about some of the things that you can do. Um, part of the challenge is um, time. And all the research shows that students, uh, especially middle and high school students, need sleep. They also need to have downtime. They, it's family time really makes a difference. And so all the different pieces that we see in the research show that just filling up your day with nothing but work and then four or five hours of homework, which some schools are still giving, believe it or not, um, you have no time for that downtime. And the research is showing that it's really, really important for students to have that kind of downtime. So we're gonna talk tonight a little bit about how to alleviate some of the stress and anxiety, what parents can do. And I would like to welcome um, Bill Sticksrud, uh, who just vanished again. He'll be back in a second. Um, so we'll, we'll welcome him in just a moment. And he's gonna talk a little bit about the research behind this. He's done a ton of work and he has a new book out called The Pressured Child, 
and another book called The Self-Driven Child. And it's really talking about the research uh, behind what is going on and why we really need to make a difference in the approach that we're taking and how parents um, can help. Um, so as soon as he appears, um, oh, there you are. Bill, are you set? Bill, can you hear me? Um, so uh, just while Bill's getting his um, computer there all set, um, I wanted to just say a couple of things about, um, about you know, downtime. So family time, you know, I know that the challenge is when you have a middle schooler, you have a high schooler, it seems like the last thing they want to do is spend time with their parents. But in, it, they don't want to spend time with their parents where parents are saying, hey, have you finished your homework? If that's the only message that you're giving them, right? But they do want to spend time um, asking their parents questions that don't feel like they're going to get a judgmental kind of answer. And so um, one of the things that the research shows is that um, family time, whether it's in the car where they don't have to look at you, they can just listen to you, um, they will ask questions. They do actually want to hear what you have to say. Um, also, um, family dinner times, when you can do it, I know it feels hard um, you know, in, in this generation, but especially with COVID and more people home, the structured times when there's not a lot at stake, but it can be just a conversation where especially it's driven by the, this child, where the child can ask questions and where the parents ask what they think makes a huge, huge difference. And all those family times, whether it's in the car, whether it's dinner time, whatever it may be, really registers with students, whether or not they uh, admit it up front to you, they may or may not say that to you, but it really does make a difference to them. Um, so, you know, what other ways, um, you know, what are the two ways that students can really use their time productively that can alleviate some of that stress? As I mentioned, family time is really big. Um, when COVID eases up, um, uh, students getting even a short-term small after-school job, whether it's working in the neighborhood walking dogs or helping feed a cat or getting a very, um, you know, a few, just a few hours a week um, at, a, at a job locally nearby, um, it really is terrific for their independence. Um, it gives them confidence and that, had that sense of responsibility. Students really want responsibility and they tend to live up to the respons responsibilities that we give them. We give them to them in small doses. Um, you know, I know many, many students are involved in sports and they teach teamwork and dedication, persistence. Um, short sports can be great. Um, however, one of the things that has vanished is the three sport athlete that we used to have uh, all the time where they did different sports at different times. And it really took a, a great deal of pressure off their body um, instead of doing the same sport year round. And I, you know, I will admit to being prejudiced against these travel teams that ask students to do one sport year round all the time. And we start to see all sorts of injuries from that. Um, Bill, are you able to hear me now? I can, can you hear me? Uh, yes, perfect. So um, I'm just going to mention two other things, then I'm going to turn it over to Bill. Um, but um, so family time, perhaps a job, sports are terrific uh, within reason. Um, volunteer work is great for building empathy. And it's something that I did with my ch own children. Um, it was just one Saturday a month and we used to do some volunteer work delivering meals for, uh, for the elderly. Um, and it was a small amount of time, but it was something we did together. And it really, really made a difference. And you really do see that empathy build in the students when they have that opportunity. Um, so um, there are things that they can do with their time that are productive and that can also get them off video games you know, because that's not something we want them to spend all their time on. Um, but um, there's a lot of research behind this. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Bill and let Bill talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, about the work that he's been doing um, and thinking about the pressured child and what we can do um, to address it. So um, hey, Bill, take it away. What, did I screw up the time? Uh, yeah, that's okay. No, you're fine. I thought we started at 7. So we started at 6.30, but that's okay. Oh, no. Oh, no. You're fine. I, I did a little stuff of the introduction, and we are perfectly ready for you. So okay, everyone. well, I will get started then. So, um, so I am um, I'm a clinical neuropsychologist, and I make a living uh, by testing kids, and I have for the last 35 years or so, and um, and I never get tired of it. 
And in, in part, because I, I love what kids say. And I, I just, I, I tested this kid um, two, two or three years ago who has autism. He's 13, he was 13 years old. And, I, and he, his parents said he has a savant ability that if you tell him your birth date, he can tell you what day of the week you're born. And so I, I go to the office one day and, and he, this kid's there and, and, and a couple of the younger psychology associates try it out and they say, oh God, Bill, he, he, he nails it. You, you should do this. So he, the kid asked me what my birthday. I said, November 11th, 1949. He, he really thinks for a minute. And then he says, 1940s, I can't go back that far. <laughs> but so it's, it's a fun way to make a living. So what I want to talk about is um, I, I want to talk about a, a book that, that I wrote with my friend Ned Johnson in 2018 called The Self-Driven Child. I want to talk about some of the ideas from the book. And, and I want to say that, that, um, that Clay, Clay, Clay is, is an absolutely brilliant educator. He's, he, um, he's the head of the school here in Silver Spring, where I live for 12 years, and one of the best schools in the whole city, this whole area. Brilliant educator. And, um, but in any case, let, let me tell you kind of a little bit about um, what I think in terms of this idea of, of more better life quality, more learning, less stress for kids. Um, Ned and I wrote this book called The Self-Driven Child, The Science and Sense of Giving Your Kids More Control Over Their Lives. And uh, our, we had two main concerns. One was that this epidemic of stress-related mental health problems. And second, so many of the kids that I see who have learning disabilities or ADHD, they just aren't very motivated developing themselves. They really have the idea that, that, that you know, I'm not going to be a top student, so what's the point of trying? And my, my, my co-author, Ned, who, who's a really high-end test prep guy, says so many of the kids he sees are just obsessively driven. And we, we, that we, they just don't have very healthy motivation, certainly not sustainable motivation. And so we, we think, of what, what's the... First, I'll talk for a minute about the mental health part. When you were writing the book, a woman by the name of Jean Twenge had, had written a few years earlier that young people, college, high school, college age kids, by uh, uh, in, in 2007, were five to eight times more likely to report symptoms of anxiety disorder or major depression than young people the same age were during the Great, during the Great Depression during World War II, during the Cold War, during the Vietnam War. And while we were writing the book in 2017, she wrote a new paper, and just, it was written up in the Atlantic, the title of which was, Has, Has the Smartphone Destroyed a Generation? Yeah, the idea was that she'd never seen anything like the spike in anxiety disorders and depression that she saw between 2012 and 2017. And her hypothesis that has to do with young people's use of social media. Um, and it, it, it's controversial, but we, we see this, this really the, the unprecedented level of anxiety, depression, loneliness in young people. And a lot of times when I lecture about this, parents say, does it get better in college? Well, it actually gets worse in college. I mean, the college, college mental health is just off the charts bad. I mean, even, even in 2014, and it's, it's much worse now, 40% of Yale undergraduates sought mental health services. My co-author, Ned, graduated from Williams, 60% of the kids seek mental health services. They can't hire mental health people fast enough. You know, and, and I, I was lecturing about our book in Houston about a year ago, sometime, just before COVID. And, when, and, and I was talking with these, these kids who are in student government, this kind of elite independent school in Houston. And I said, how many of you want to be happy as an adult? And they all kind of sheepishly raised their hand and, 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 and uh, well, could it die, you know? And I said, what do people tell you it takes to be happy in adult life? And they thought for a minute, this one kid said, well, we get the idea that if you get into a good enough college, everything will be set, which is just it's so fundamentally wrong. I mean, if, 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 if achievement was the key to happiness, the kids at Yale and Harvard and Princeton and, and, and Williams would be the happiest people on the planet. And, and they're among the most miserable. It, is, it doesn't work that way. There's a woman at, 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 uh, at Yale by the name of Lori Santos, who's a psychologist. She, she, she teaches biological psychology. But she lived in dormitories with Yale undergraduates for years. And she just was struck by how miserable they were. And so she taught the first, she taught a course on happiness to, to, to in, at Yale, it was the most popular course by far. 
in the history of Yale University. The most subscribed course at Harvard is a course in happiness. And we want, and, and Ned and I have just finished a new book, part of which is, is about talking with kids about what it takes to be happy before you before you, you're, you're miserable yeller. And so we want um, many of the families, many of the kids that I work with, that Ned works with, have the idea that no matter what I have to sacrifice to get into a good college, and if, if, whether it's, it's staying up all night, getting five hours of sleep, being fluent stress, getting depressed, getting a, going on anxiety disorder medicine, it'll all be worth it. Our feeling is that it's not worth it. That I, I, our feeling is that, that the most important outcome of adolescence is not where you go to college. It, it's who you are as a person and what kind of brain you have. And ideally, you have a brain that's not chronically tired and stressed, that can actually enjoy your success. That, that's what we want. And the, the other, so I mentioned that, that there's this mental health issue and also that this motivational issue. And um, there, there's a study that came out in 2017 by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It looked at the factors that contribute to mental health problems in adolescence. And the first four were poverty, trauma, discrimination, and, accept, and excessive pressure to excel. I mean, excessive pressure to excel was in the same ballpark as trauma, poverty, discrimination. And, you know, that we want kids to have healthy self-motivation, to have that sustainable drive to develop in themselves so they have something useful to offer this world. And here, the, the, the thesis of our book, is that a sense of control, a healthy sense of control is about the best thing you can have as a kid or actually an adult. It's good, it's good for everything. And from a motivational point of view, well, I'll start from the stress point of view, that you think about it, if you're anxious, your thinking's out of control. If you're depressed, you have no sense of control. And, and there's, there's, there's a lot of evidence that actually, when you're in your right mind, when you feel healthy, you feel focused, happy, engaged, motivated, you have a sense of control. And we, we know there's, there's research with animals that, that shows that if, if a rat is in a, if rat A and rat B, rat, they're, they're in these plexiglass cages, their tails outside the cage has a little electrode on it. There's a wheel inside the cage. Rat A, gets, his tail gets shot. It's not painful, it's just annoying. And he turns the wheel. And, he, and, and when he turns the wheel, his prefrontal cortex activates. Uh, and then when the prefrontal cortex activates, it dampens down the stress response. So he's turning that wheel and the shock stops. And, and before it stops, he's just in coping mode with, it, with the prefrontal cortex dampening down the stress response. So he learns after several times that he can control this stressful situation. So then they unplug, they, 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 dis, they disconnect. The wheel doesn't work anymore. But he still goes into coping mode, not very stressed, turning that wheel, even though it doesn't work. Rat B is yoked to rat A, so that rat, rat B gets shocked, he turns the wheel, and nothing happens. It only happens when, when rat A turns the wheel. And the guy who's done this research over the last 30 years says that that, 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 sen that sense of being able to control a special situation, it inoculates you from the harmful effects of stress. And so if you, six or seven years ago, there was an epidemic of, of suicides in Palo Alto, the Palo Alto area. And so, so there's an article in the Atlantic about it. And a couple, some of the experts, a couple experts were asked, what's going on with these kids? And one of them said, they feel existentially impotent. One of them said, I've done therapy with these kids for 15 years, in, or 25 years. And, and 15 years ago, they used to fight back. Now they don't fight back anymore. I guess this, this incredible pressure is just they kind of they're just resigned to it. And we want kids to to, to have this he this healthy sense of control that actually allows them to feel happy, to to, to to not be overly stressed when something stressful happens. To go into coping mode and not feel overwhelmed, to not be highly anxious, highly stressed. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about kind of how we can do that. But but th that that's the relationship, the sense of control to mental health, that it's just good for, it, it's good for everything related to mental health. Second, with regards to motivation, every place that Ned and I look to try to understand how do kids become self-motivated? It wasn't, it, 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 all the arrows pointed in the direction of autonomy. It wasn't to dutifully doing their homework. I mean, it was that, that sense of control. 
the, the theory that we looked at the most is called self-determination theory. And it, it, it's it probably the, certainly the best validated theory of motivation been studied for 30 years. And it holds that in order to be intrinsically motivated, to be internally motivated, you have to have three needs met for a sense of a relatedness, a sense of competence, and a sense of autonomy. And it's that, that, that autonomy is probably the most important, but, but in our culture, especially in kind of in, in the kind of high achieving areas that we live in, that we, we tend to focus so much on competence that we oftentimes under, undermine our relationship with our kids. And we, we, um, we definitely undermine their sense of autonomy. And we, we know that autonomy is, is hugely important for relationships. So we want to, we want to do everything we can to support that, that sense of control or autonomy. And um, so here's how we do this. <clears throat> well, I just want to tell you one thing. Uh, we, we looked at, at this self-determination theory. So some of you listening may also know Carol Dweck's work on, on mindset theory. Uh, and then where the growth mindset idea, well, the growth mindset is really a sense of control. I get better through my own efforts. I'm not helpless. I'm not hopeless. I'm not passive and I'm, I'm not resigned. So it's really a big deal for, motive, for healthy motivation for mental health in general. Now, here's some of the stuff that, that we suggest to, 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 to parents <clears throat> and educators uh, regarding nurturing the sense of control. And the first thing is that we, we suggest that as, as, as our kids get older, we think, about the, we think about ourselves more as consultants to our kids than as their manager or their boss or their homework police or whatever. And, and I started thinking about this very early in my career where I, 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 I've always worked with a lot of underachievers. <laughs> and I always ask underachievers, if you're not turned in an assignment, who's most upset? And invariably, the kid says, my mom. And then I say, well, who's next most upset? They say my dad, then my, then, then my teacher, then my tutor, then my therapist. The kid's never on the list. And it's, it always struck me as something wrong with that picture, that, that being more upset than the kid was for not turning in the work. I also, I'd go to school meetings and I'd see, and I'd have a, a, a learning specialist say, it, it, it takes two learning specialists and a tutor and the mom on top of the kid all the time in order to get any work done. And that, that I, I always say stop immediately because that won't change until the energy changes. And so I had a lot of experiences early on of seeing that this, people working harder than the kid would work and, and knowing that's not going to work. And also tremendous fussing and fighting about homework. And actually, in 1986, I wrote two papers on homework. One, I reviewed the literature on homework, the research literature, and I was stunned to learn for the first time that homework doesn't contribute to learning in elementary school. And I what's, what's all this fussing and fighting about? And kind of minimally to, to learning in, in, in middle school and high school as well. And so I, I wrote a paper, that, an article in McCall's, McCall's Magazine about how not to fight with your kid about homework. And I simply suggested, tell your kid, I love you too much to fight with you about your homework. And then you say, I'm willing to do anything I can to help you. If you need help, I'll try to get, you, get somebody, I'll try to get a tutor, but I'm not willing to fight with you all the time about it. I'm not willing to, to act like somehow I, I'm supposed to be able to make you do it because I couldn't make you do it. All I have to do is flop to the floor. And also, I mean, I, I don't want to just, I don't want to weaken you by taking responsibility for something that's yours. And so the idea, this idea that I love you too much to fight with you about your homework, right? it's, it's not intuitive to everybody. One of my clients, um, read our book in 2018 and sent me an email and said, I, I just told my 13-year-old th uh, son, I love you too much to fight with you about your homework. And first he smiled and then he hugged me and they said, Is something wrong with your mom? <laughs> but but, it, but it, it's, it's a good idea that, that as kids get older, to think about yourself more, not as somebody who always knows what's best or supposed to be in, in managing the kid's life, but as somebody who's, whose role is, is to help the kid eventually learn to run his own life. And that, that, that's, this, that's my goal, is kids know how to run their own life before they go to college. I was lecturing in, in, in uh, someplace in Texas a couple of years ago, and, and I happened to mention one of the most elite schools in the, in the DC area. 
And this, uh, this, this woman came up to me after the lecture and said, I, I work at the Menninger Clinic here in, in I guess, Houston. And, and, um, and it's a really, uh, really prestigious mental health place. She said, we know this elite school in Washington, D.C. very well because many of the kids get into these top universities, but they can't handle it emotionally. So they drop out, go on medical leave, and they come here for treatment. And, I, and, and she said, every single one of them, they simply didn't have enough experience running their own lives. You know, they're, 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 they jumped through this hoop and zip hoop, zip hoop and they had, everything's were all treaded out for them. And they didn't have to think about what's important to me. I, I don't, what, what kind of life do I want? And I want kids to, to, to be able to, to run their own life before they go, to, go off to college. And so part of this consulting idea, there's, there's three major implications. One is that we offer help we don't try to force it down kids' throat, and we offer advice rather than trying to just tell kids a thousand times or just to, to, just blather on, even though they aren't interested. And so, what we want to do is we want to say, "I, I got an idea about that. You, uh, you, I got you want to hear my, I got some advice. You want to hear it? And, and simply, um, is there a way that I could help? And actually, I was talking. You, you folks are in Westchester County, right? I, I was talking in Westchester County um, a couple of years ago about, about the book. And, and a woman, I was talking about this idea of, of offering help, not trying to force it. And this woman who's in the front row, she turned to the rest of the audience. She said, this idea has completely changed my relationship with my 15-year-old daughter. She's in a boarding school, and we talk on the phone three or four times a week. But every time we talk, it, it turns into an argument because she brings up a problem. I say, well, you, you should do this or this or this. And then she fights me on it and just devolves into this argument. Last week when she called, I, I, I just she, she, she brought up some problem. And I said, is there a way that I could help? She said, it completely changed the energy in our relationship. So part of this idea is we offer help. We don't try to force it. And same thing with advice. And secondly, ideally, we, we, the, 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 kids, the kids, as they get older, especially when they're, when they're high school students, they make the important decisions about their own life. And with, with younger kids, we want to encourage them to make decisions and, and it's kind of teach them how to make good decisions. And with teenagers, I've always felt that the best message you can give a teenager besides I'm crazy about you is that I have confidence in your ability to make decisions about your own life and to learn from your mistakes. And I want you to have a ton of practice doing that before I send you off to college. So it's decision making. Kids, are, kids are, are, are capable of making very good decisions for themselves. And, and I say, go with, kids, go with kids' decisions unless they're crazy. And as long as they're willing to let, listen to other people's opinions, people have more knowledge and experience than they do. But ideally, we want, we want kids to give the message, I have confidence in your ability to make decisions, and I want you to have practice doing that. And then the third implication of this idea of thinking about yourself more as a consultant is that if a kid has a problem, ask yourself, whose problem is it? Because as mammals, we're, we're wired to jump in and try to solve the problems of people we love, especially our kids. And yet, as I was saying earlier, the, the, the rat A became resilient because he had the, the rat, because he got this shock, this, this stressful experience. He activated his prefrontal cortex to try to solve it, turning the wheel. And that experience changed his brain in a way that he just almost was impossible to stress as an adult. So we want kids. We, we don't want kids to be unnecessarily stressed. But when they have problems, ideally, we, we say, is there a way that I could help? Or we have to express confidence in their ability to figure it out, as opposed to solving it for them. Uh, Ned and I were lecturing in, in Palo Alto last year, right, just right before COVID. And, um, and we we're talking about this stuff. And we got an email the next day, uh, actually, the woman who organized the lecture the next day, saying um, that I, when I got home from the lecture last night, my 13-year-old son was, was crying. I said, what's, what's the matter, honey? And he said, I'm the weakest kid in seventh grade. And her first impulse, is, as, as we all would, we would try to talk, no, you aren't, honey. You, you're, 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 and kind of talk him out of it. But just, she says, what she just said, that, 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 kind of, that must suck to feel like that. Let me know if there's anything I can do. And kid goes to bed. The next morning, he's kind of, he, he says, mom, look at my plan. And he's drawn up a plan of, 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 of working with weight or push-ups or something to get himself stronger. And she didn't have to say a word. All she expressed was that willingness to help. So part of what we suggest is this idea of thinking about yourself as a consultant. We also place a big emphasis in our book on what we call radical downtime. 
And the idea is that life is so stressful these days and so fast paced, we need more radical downtime as opposed to you know, knitting or playing bridge. We, we need times to actually when, 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 when we're doing nothing. And so in the book, we talk about having time in, in, in the day for young people to daydream, just be in their head, to not, be, not have your ear, earbuds in, not, not be in front of a screen. It doesn't have to be forever, but, but we know that these periods of, of where you're just reflecting on yourself are crucial for creativity, for problem solving, and for young people, for developing a sense of empathy and, 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 and the, the sense of, of identity. They have to have time to reflect on their own life. And secondly, it's meditation. Ned, I, I've been practicing meditation for 47 years. Ned's been practicing for a long time. We both, and, and when kids meditate, and, and they, especially in school, we see dramatic changes. The same, same kind of changes we see in adults. So we're big fans of, of, the, of, of radical downtime where it looks like you're doing nothing, but actually what you're doing is extremely good for your brain and body. And thirdly is sleep. And you, you, you could not overestimate how important sleep is uh, for kids' development, for the developing brain. God, Clay, if I, if I was a teacher, I'd much rather teach kids for four hours if they slept for eight and teach them for eight if they slept for four. I mean, from a learning and memory and re retention point of view, it's just ridiculous. From a mental point of view, mental health point of view, it's absurd. I mean, you lose a night of sleep. You know, your kid, kid pulls an all-nighter. The amygdala, the part of the brain that senses and reacts to threat, is 60% more reactive. And also, you lose, you do an all-nighter. The connections between your prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, which is the best marker for resilience, goes south. I mean, you see, you see significantly less connection after losing a night's sleep. Also, if you memorize a list of words before you go to bed, and some of them are negative words like death and pain, and some of them are, are you know, love and flowers, some are kind of neutral words like, pe neutral words like pencil or, or, or plate. Um, if you don't sleep well, you, you remember the negative words much more. One of the world's sleep experts said that losing sleep is like a negativity bomb. And so we have a big, we have two chapters in the book, actually one, one, one purely devoted to sleep uh, and, and talking with kids about sleep and, and, and negotiating with kids about developing healthy sleep uh, patterns. And then um, the last thing I wanna say is that um, we, we emphasize in the book, the importance of kids having an accurate model of reality. What we mean by that is, is like these kids in Houston had this idea that the most important thing that could possibly happen is where they go to college. But if you actually look at the, the research on college, it turns out it doesn't really make much difference for most kids. It doesn't make much difference where they go. And, and I, I wish we would just tell kids the truth. And it also turns out that, that valedictorians, by the time they're 26 or 27, they aren't more successful than other people. I wish kids, more kids knew that. So the many of the kids that I see who are really not, who are really sucking in, in high school, the first thing I tell them is you can flunk every single one of your high school classes. If you decide that was a bad idea, you can go to community college for 30 credits, that's two semesters, and then you can apply to almost all the colleges in this country without showing your high school transcript. And when I tell them that, they start working harder in school because they, they, they realize, oh, there's a path for me. I haven't screwed up my whole life. So I want them to have an accurate model of reality and, and that, that college is good. There, there's advantages going to elite colleges, but it's not necessary to have a successful and satisfying life. And arguably the, the key to mental health, certainly one of, the, one of the keys to mental health is changing thinking of I have to, to I want to. That, 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 and now I'm in control of this. I, 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 I'm taking charge of it, something I want to do as opposed to I have to do. And the same thing, letting kids know that there's advantages going to lead college. I'm not, not denying that. However, it's not necessary. So if you want to do it, go for it. But don't feel that somehow your life will suck. Or you'll have a C plus life if you aren't a straight A student. And lastly, I just want to say that um, that um, in, our, in our new book, we, as I mentioned, we, we put an emphasis on talking with kids about happiness. And certainly, one of the things that, that for, particularly for, for, for teenagers, I mean, that, that's really associated with happiness is, is relationships, which is partly why COVID is just so painful for so many kids. But it's also true that having a close relationship with parents 
is our, it, it's like it's the closest thing to a silver bullet in protecting kids from uh, emotional problems. And, and the challenge is kids at high achieving schools tend to feel less close to their parents. There's this pressure kind of idea than, than kids in kind of middle class uh, families and middle class schools. And so uh, I just want to suggest, um, and this, this, for many families, this is much easier in COVID, just spend time alone with them and argue, and, argue and, and, and just do as much as you can. Place a priority just on enjoying your kids as they are. There's, there's nothing that, 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 that builds kids more than simply being enjoyed. Um, and so I'll just stop there, Clay, and turn it back over to you. And Super. Well, I want to say two. Thank you so much, Bill. I want to say two things on that. One, uh, to your last point about spending time with your kids. Um, when I was uh, first a teach, first started teaching, um, I had a, a student who was not the greatest student in the world, but a good kid. And his father, as a ninth grader, he, his father drove him to school every day, every single morning, and dropped him off. And it was. It turned out I found out three quarters of the way into the year that it was taking his father forty minutes to get to the school and 40 minutes to get back before he went to work. And so at some point, somebody uh, told the dad that, you know, you look, you know, there's other ways we have some bus service, we'll pick up at the Metro. You don't have, that's a lot of time you're taking. And he said, no, that 40 minutes when I'm driving to school, we have the best conversations and we have real time and he doesn't have to look at me so we can have conversations where there's not that pressure, you know, of like watching what the answer is gonna be. And he said, I wouldn't give that for up for anything. And for four years, he drove his child 40 minutes each way in the morning. Um, uh, and, that much uh, of a difference, you know? and so I agree wholeheartedly with that, finding those moments that are, uh, you know, that are less, to feel less daunting to the kids and establishing those relationships. I also want to say a word about sleep. Um, because sometimes people hear that, you know, the thing that you need sleep and say, oh, well, then I'll just force my 16 year old to go to bed at nine o'clock at night, right? Well, that is not going to happen, right? That's not the way they're wired. And so sleep doesn't mean let's get them all to go to bed at an hour that doesn't work for them. Um, but it does mean that if they're going to have a busy week and they have to get up early for school, letting them, you know, if they're going to go to bed at midnight, because that's when they're tired and ready, they can sleep in Saturday morning and that's okay. Um, they do need sleep, um, but it's got to be on their terms. It can't be on the adult's terms. Um, somebody told me that the only reason that high school has traditionally started at 730 in the morning for years is for the, for the teachers, right? <laughs> they're up and they're ready to go. Um, but, you know, the, I heard about a school, maybe you, you mentioned the school bill, I think, years ago. Um, it was a school for kids who had sort of, a school of last resort in New York City. Um, uh, for kids who had just made, not made it through the public or the private school, had no other place to go. And the school ran from something like three in the afternoon to nine in the evening, um, because that was when it really worked for the kids. That's when they were at their best. Um, and so, you know, no, no teacher wants to do that, right? But, um, you know, we have to do, we do have to think about what's going to work from the student's point of view. Yeah. And, and we, we um, in the Self-Driven Child and also in, in our new book, which is coming out in August, um, we, you know, we, we, have, we place a big emphasis on this collaborative problem solving. You know, the, the, and, and where, where you know, if kids are, are, are obviously sleep deprived, you know, that we, we, we have some leverage. I mean, we have some leverage depending on how old they are. But you, as, as, as Clay said, you can't force a kid to sleep. What we can do is make sure that kids understand the importance of sleep and, and, and at least brainstorm with them. And, and what we suggest is make getting enough sleep a family priority because I've, I've worked with so many families where the, 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 the mom says, "Got to fight with him every night trying to get him to go to sleep." And I said, "How do you sleep?" Well, I have terrible insomnia. You know, I said, "Let's support each other. Let's make a family goal." But what we encourage kids to do is to think about: you probably need somewhere between fifty-six and sixty-three hours of sleep a, a, a week. Let's plan that in and see what, would you, what, what what's the rest of your week would look like if we make that the priority. And a lot of kids will actually do that and, and, we, and sh share your own your own experience of trying to you know, I, I don't know anybody who I, I know very few people who get enough sleep and it, we, it's, it's a challenge for all of us and certainly when I said we have leverages I mean if, if, if my kids were still at home um, I, I would require them to wear a Fitbit uh, at, at night when they, if they wanted to drive uh, they have, have eight hours for two nights in a row to, to get to, to be able to drive I mean we have some and, and also I've always felt, no, that's not that structure. The last 12 or 13 years, I've felt that, that what we want to do with kids when they're in ninth grade 
is say, here's what I need to see you'd be able to do before, before I, I know it's a good investment to spend money on college. It's because a lot of the kids that I see go up to college who just aren't ready. In fact, Ned and I had an article, uh, I think in October, 2019 in the New York Times, um, because by, by, it came out of Thanksgiving, by November 1st, we already knew seven kids who'd started college who were already home by, by November 1st. I think this idea of, of here's what I need to see. And one of it is you can, you can, get, you can manage your own sleep. You can get your butt out of bed and get yourself in, in, into bed and, and, and not be chronically tired all the time um, like that. And I think, you know, Clay, you know, your, your point, certainly, as I said, this guy is an incredible educator. And um, your point that after a couple hours, of, uh, the research suggests that even in high school, after a couple of hours of homework, you might as well forget it. And it, it's just, it's so obvious why. I mean, I, I, some years ago, I was trying to teach, my wife and I were going to teach ourselves Hebrew. And we started practicing. We had these little work, these little primers. And we started working on them like in the morning, a couple of mornings before we went to work. And, we, and I, I, like after two or three mornings, I, I knew like maybe 12 or 14 letters. And one night at 8.30, she said, let's work on Hebrew together. So we got our workbook. And I'm, I'm plotting through this first line of three-letter words. And I know all the letters, but it's just, it's just like, I'm going, like walking through mud. I go to the second line and I, I start reading these, these three letter words. I think, oh my God, these are even harder. And then I eventually I look up and I realize exactly the same words on, on the second line were on the first line. And what I realized at 8.30, I didn't feel tired. I could watch TV, I could watch a movie, I could, I could give a lecture, <laughs> but I couldn't learn. It was just so incredibly uh, 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 palpable for me, this, this what a tired brain can't learn. And so I think you know your your your, your approach to learning with, with much more active involvement and um, use of the arts and and really keeping the focus on on healthy brains and what it takes for a kids' brain to be healthy so that that you don't kids I mean a lot of kids that I see who, who have too much homework I say go to bed at ten and get up an hour if, if you normally go to bed at eleven go to bed at ten. And get up a half hour early because you, you're you, because you'll work so much more efficiently. Just do your, your homework before in the morning you, because you, with a rested brain, you'll just work so much more efficiently. It'll take you twice as long to do it if you stay up between uh, 10 30 and 11. So, um, on that, let me jump in, uh, Bill. Thank you. Yeah, I think I agree with you completely. I wanted to say there's three things um, in terms of what parents can do, and then maybe we can take some questions, Bill, if people have them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, uh, the, the first thing is I agree with Bill on relationships. We've talked about that. I think it's so important, uh, positive relationships. And um, then there's three other things I think parents can do. Number one um, is build, helping build your child's strengths. We all know that we wanna help our kids when they're struggling in an area, but we don't wanna do that at the expense of actually shoring up their strengths because their strengths are probably what they're gonna spend their life doing. Um, so, you know, sometimes I've, I've had um, situations where a kid is an incredible basketball player and is not doing any homework or not doing enough homework. And so the first thing we hear from sometimes from teachers and sometimes from parents is, well, let's yank him off the basketball team, you know, as a punishment. As if a student's going to be yanked off the basketball team and say, oh, I'm not allowed to play basketball anymore. I'll devote that time to homework now. I'm going to spend all that two hours I had before doing homework. Well, that is never in a million years going to happen. And so I worked for an educator at, at the field school in Washington, D.C., who had a policy that a, no student would ever be kicked off a, a team for not doing homework because that was a strength area, something the kids loved and was passionate about and was devoted to. And taking away the good stuff doesn't mean they're going to be suddenly excited and motivated to do the hard stuff. So I think it's really, really important to help your children find their strengths and to encourage those and carve out time for that. Your strength there is build confidence and independence. It builds that sense of self-worth that, uh, that Bill was talking about. And it's really what's gonna help them succeed in, in college. Um, and uh, you know, I think the carrot rather than the stick um, is, is really important in that. Um, the second area- can, 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 I, can I comment on that, Clay? You know, um, uh, when Ned and I were writing The Self-Driven Child, we, we, looking at motivation, we looked at this Carol Dweck's mindset theory, self-determination theory, but also at flow theory. And flow is that experience where you're, you're completely engaged in something that, that, that's, that's, that's challenging for you. So you have to give it your full attention, your full effort. 
but it's not stressful. You know, you, you can get it, some of us get it at work where we're, we're in, in, engaged in a challenging task, where you can be working on something, focused, really, really focused, really motivated, really determined, but not stressed. And it can see, you can be working on it for an hour and it seems like 15 minutes went by. You, you, kids get it, we can get it playing sports, we can get, get it doing art, music, various things. Uh, but that, it, um, one of the bodies of research, this flow research, we, we looked at this guy named, the research of a guy named Reed Larson, who looked at how do children become self-motivated adolescents. And what he concluded was that it's not through dutifully doing their homework every night. It's through what he called the passionate pursuit of pastimes. And the idea would be, you, know, you got a three-year-old building with Legos. You, you got a 15-year-old practicing basketball or playing the violin or, or rock climbing or doing coding. It requires that full engagement of their attention and their motivational system. He's saying they're sculpting a brain that knows how to, knows how to be completely focused, completely energetic, completely determined, and not stressed. He said that's the optimal brain state to be in most of the time. And uh, kids are when kids are, are pursuing their pastimes, that that this is the optimal. This, this is what cultures that self motivated brain. And this made sense to me because I was a, I was a C plus student in high school, and I don't remember ever getting past page fifty in a book. I don't remember turning anything in, in, in time, but I do remember being passionate about rock and roll. I was in a rock and roll band. It was my life. And I'd go into this little room where I had an organ and a record player, and I'd learn songs, or I'd, I'd teach myself uh, uh, some riffs on, uh, on, on the organ. I'd, I'd, I'd practice something. And I'd, I'd, I'd tell myself, I'll practice for a couple hours, and then I'll do some homework. And every night, I'd come out of my music room three hours later, having no idea what time it was. Where was I? Kind of was completely, had been completely absorbed. And so I, I, I was a C-plus student. I had a 2.0 uh, grade point average the first quarter of my senior year. My father died in my senior year. It kind of woke me up, kind of I took school more seriously. But when I, was, when I was a straight A student my first semester in college, and I just think that I sculpted a brain that knew how to go pedal to the metal. When, when what school became important to me, I turned it on. And so I completely agree with, with you, Clay, that, that finding kids the stuff that they're passionate about, because they feel like they're good at. And I tell kids all the time, I told my own kids, I care as much about my, my clearly my kid who has learning disabilities and ADHD. I care as much about your baseball as, as, as I do about your, your school. I think that's really, really important. Um, so, um, so, uh, so building relationships, building strengths. Um, I think the other two would be building resources. And that means finding trusted adults. You know, sometimes it's aunt, du it's uncle Doug or aunt so-and-so or something like that, or a family friend, somebody who doesn't have the same emotional um, baggage at, at, at risk when you're, you know, with a parent and child. I know for my three kids, sometimes it was really hard to have a conversation about something that really mattered because there was so much emotion involved. Um, so other trusted adults that they can spend time with that they can talk to. Um, and then the fourth one is building their independence. Um, and I wanna say one word about um, you know, teenage rebellion. Um, you know, it's funny because um, students at a certain age need to rebel against their parents. That's how they become separate adults. And so they are going to find ways to reject some of the things that you believe in. And so, you know, sometimes I tell parents, you know, I have a, a student comes in, you know, decides they're gonna dye their hair some crazy color. And I always tell the parents, you know, some parents want to say, oh, that's fine, whatever you want, that's no problem. But I usually tell parents, show a little bit of resentment over it, because if you don't, rebe if you don't show that you don't like it, they're going to find another way to rebel. And so you might as well, you know, dive in some of the stuff that's easy, you know. So I usually recommend if they dye their hair or something else that's minor, get a little bit upset, you know, because they need that. They need to know that they are defying you in some way. Um, and sometimes if you get upset about the little stuff, they won't go, you know, off, you know further off the deep end. Um, so, you know, protesting some of that little stuff. Um, you know, and I also think that, um, that part of that independence is acknowledging that they are becoming independent. I remember my oldest daughter had a lot of trouble around 10th, 11th grade and was feeling a lot of loss of control as Bill was talking about. And, you know, want to do, do some things to, you know, one night she stayed at a friend's house and didn't tell me where she was and things like that. And, you know, the next day she came home and, you know, and I, you know, finally figured out where she was. She came home and she sat down and she knew I was upset with her. And she said, you know, there's, you can't make me do anything. I can really do whatever I want now. You know, I have keys. I have a car. I can go anywhere I want and, I, and you can't stop me. 
And I wanted to, to argue with her and then I stopped and I don't know what hit me, but it, what I said to her, thankfully was, you're absolutely right. There's nothing I can, you can do whatever you want and I can't stop you. And then she waited me for, for me to finish the sentence with the but. And I bit my tongue and I didn't say anything. And it was amazing because it completely changed our relationship because she needed me to acknowledge that she was an independent person. And the fact was that I couldn't stop her. If she wanted to walk out of the house and go somewhere and not tell me, I couldn't stop her. But she needed me to hear that. And it really changed our relationship for much more, become much more positive because I was acknowledging her independence. So, you know, in the, in the long run, you know, as Bill said at the very beginning, we want happy kids. We want them to be happy. We want to find their area of strength and we want them to go off and whatever they're doing to be good at it and feel good about it and, you know, have a happy life, whatever form that takes. And so the, the most, the best that we can do is support them, not try to solve every problem, um, support their areas of strength, help them when they ask for it. Um, but be there for them and really uh, respond to what they're saying they need, and not always just telling them what we think they need, because not everybody's going to have a smooth path. And even the kids who are bright and who are sailing through are feeling stress, as Bill mentioned. And so we need to give them permission to back off a little bit and to find peace. And a lot of schools are doing meditation now. They're finding ways to make this work. Um, so um, I wanted to uh, maybe just take a couple minutes if, in case any of you guys had any questions for Bill or for me, feel free to unmute and ask a question if, if you got it. And if you need to pop off, that's fine too. Um, you know, we really appreciate you being here and I'm really grateful to, to Bill for being here with me. Um, I have some tremendous respect for him um, and all that he stands for. So um, if you have some questions, please feel free to ask. Um, I have a question for Bill. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, so Bill, um, actually, um, this seminar is just so timely. I just got my daughter's uh, report card and it's all B and C's and she's always a B and C student. Uh, and, and I heard your seminar and I understand that my role was more like a, you know, um, a coach rather than a parent, you know, like coaching her, offering help, a guidance. But, you know, in the old days, I would blew off and scream, but, but she's a BNC student. And what you told me just now really struck me as saying, you go to two-year community college, nobody will see your high school grade. And then you can go to any college under the sun. And <laughs> this is so true, but nobody realized it, you know? So, so my question for you is, seeing that gray, B and C's, you know, and it's always B and C's and she's not motivated. She's not dumb, but you know, kids, ninth grade kids, they're not motivated. So my question is step-by-step, step, you know, if, if you could give me step concrete, you know, like concrete steps, what to do. I understand I need to be, you know, a coach, you know, be patient and offer help, but what's the day-to-day -day interaction with her? I mean, I, how do I do it day-to-day -day with her? So, I, I want to suggest, and I, that um, well, I want to, first. I want to say that Ned and I got, got a pretty big advance to write the self-driven child. We, we we don't make any money on book sales, but, but so I, but I want you to buy the self-driven child. You can get it for like eleven bucks on Amazon or something like that. So that because it'll it'll take you through how you do this, how, how you how you transition into the, this this model of this thinking about yourself as a consultant, and part of it. Is you, you, is you remind yourself whose life is it? I mean, it, it seems to me that, that three questions that really can, can really orient our, our, our thinking about ourselves as parents are whose life is it, whose responsibility is it, and whose problem is it? And for me, this is your daughter's life. And there's, and, and as, 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 as Clay said, you can't, make them, you can't make a kid do anything and you can't make them want what they don't want. And you can't make them not want what you want. So um, uh, in this new book we're, 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 uh, that we have coming out in August, there's a, it's about talking with kids. And in this case, what we want to you, you, if your daughter's not working harder, part of what we want to do is, is say, you know, are, are you working as hard as you want? Would, would you like, and I, I ask my clients all the time, are, are you working as hard as you want to, to get better at whatever this is? And sometimes they say, I just can't make myself. And I said, would it help to get you a tutor or a coach or somebody to, to work on this? And, it's, and usually they say, yeah, that, 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 let's give that a shot. So I, I want, I, I, I think offering help, if, she, if, she want, if she's happy with B's and C's, as a, as a C plus student myself, I can't in good conscience say, no, you got to tell her how important it is to get those C's up to A's. 
and, and I tell you, with kids who aren't motivated, it is, and I'll, I'll say this again, the most powerful thing I can tell them, especially when they're in high school, is you, you haven't screwed up your whole life. You, can, you, don't have to figure, you don't have to turn this around tomorrow. Knowing that motivates them to work harder. It's, it's, just, it's, it's absurdly how powerful just being, this the reality is, this is your life that, that, you, that I have confidence you can figure out. Let me know if, that, if I can help. Now, if, 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 this is very powerful. And just as, 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 as Clay said, kind of changing the energy in your relationship where, where it's respectful and encouraging. And it's not, I mean, I, I don't want you to let her smoke pot at home. Or do, 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 we set limits on some. And, and we, we, if, if she's staying up too late and keeping you up, then we, we negotiate with her. But I think that what, what I want kids to know that is motivating to say, you know, you, you can have a great, even if you're a BC student, you, you, can, you, can, you can get a good education. You, you, don't, you, don't, the, you don't have to go to a top college to be successful in this world. Give her an accurate sense of model, a reality, but also give the message that one of the best, the two best things you can do for your brain while it's, it's developing really fast is to work really hard to get better at stuff that's important to you and to get enough sleep. And so that, that, that just so that that's what I would suggest. And just just let her know how that you're crazy about it. Just let her know that you're happy that, that you, and she, you have confidence that she can figure out her life. And I would add one thing to that, Bill, just, uh, you know, one of the things I find is that um, instead of having conversations about homework and grades and things like that, ask the students what they really, your ch children, what they care about and have conversations as, as a real person, you know, uh, and ask her questions. What, you know, did, have you read anything that's, that really fascinates you? Are you really upset or angry about anything in the world? And let their child be the expert and listen to what they say and respond and have those conversations. They love being treated like real people. Um, and I find those kinds of conversations are much more productive and much more interesting. And then they do listen to some of your points of view if you want to share, but you really ask them what they think and make them the expert. And that's when you engage them. And that's when they appreciate the value of a good intellectual conversation. And you find out also about what they care about. Um, so that's again. a really good point, Clay. There's a chapter in our book called A Non-Anxious Presence. And the idea is that systems work best when the people, whether it's a school or whether it's a corporation or a family, or a church or a synagogue, they work best if the people in charge are not highly anxious and emotionally reactive. And so one of the things that we, we, we can do, certainly that's really helped for our kids, is we work on managing our own anxiety. Because the less anxious we are, the more, uh, more, uh, more positive, more affirming we are, the more we can support autonomy in kids. Um, and so taking a long view is really one of the best ways that we, we can manage anxiety about our kids because all of our anxiety about our kids, it's about the future. Because if I could assure you, Scarlett, that, that I've seen 5,000 kids like, like, like your daughter and, and they all turn out great, you wouldn't worry that she's not that motivated right now because you just see it as, you'd see it as part of her path. It's the, the, the fear that somehow she's going to get stuck in some kind of negative place. And that and just reminding yourself that most kids turn out fine. That, that helps too. Um, so uh, if we can take one more question, maybe if somebody has one, and then uh, I do you know, want to be respectful of everybody's time. Does anybody else have a question they'd like to ask while we're still here? All right, well, thank you all so much. Thanks, Bill. Uh, it was a pleasure to work with you. Um, thank you all for coming. And uh, you, know, you, can, uh, you, uh, you can find us if you have any questions. I'm at the Cedar School. Um, and uh, we're at the cedarschool.org, uh, opening up this fall um, for kids with language-based learning differences. Um, and hoping to live all the things that we've been talking about tonight for these students. Um, so um, again, thank you. And many thanks to the Rye Library for hosting this. Um, and if you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to us. I know the Rye Library has many programs, so keep checking the website for other things that might be of interest to you. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you.